Well, 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 me hearties. Welcome back to another pirate stream here on DLive, Rockfin, YouTube, and Twitch, and Periscope. Welcome, welcome, welcome out there, pirates. How y'all doing this evening? Are we live? Are we, are we rolling live on DLive, or do I have to restart the stream? How is everyone doing out there tonight? <clears throat> You guys ready for another massive installment on the Cicada series? Because we are about to go in depth. And yes, I am live, so people will be trickling in here momentarily. So let's, uh, let's strap in and get ready for a massive, massive new discovery in the Cicada 3301 Liber Primus mystery. And our mystery of the Just Judges and some very in-depth analysis that we have of this painting tonight. So thank you all for joining me on a Friday night, and uh, let's start the show. Good evening there, Paula Brandon on uh, YouTube. Nice to see you. Well, well, well. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Let's get into the show. 
So it seems that we are on the right path with figuring out this mystery. And we have some clues that would lead us to believe that we are on the right path. Uh, one of the interesting things that I was trying to look at was, <clears throat> me personally, was trying to lay over these new um, numbers with the images and the codes over the Libra Primus. And I didn't get anywhere with that, but one of our other pirate solvers did find something. And in Star Emergence, if you listen to that, that music that I was just playing you, there is a cicada in the background of it. And that cicada has a frequency to it. So maybe that will come into play later on. Um, but there is uh, a good breakdown of that on YouTube that I did not include in this uh, show notes, but I did find it interesting. Um, <clears throat> but we are kind of on the right path of this because obviously we're getting closer to figuring out what these things mean. And one of our pirate solvers using the stuff that we've been looking at was able to decipher a huge new part of the Libra Primus. So one of the things also that let me knew that we were on the right path was when I was looking at Godertier's uh, stuff from various things, there was this uh, notebook here. And if I go and I show you this, So here's the full drawing, and this is stuff that was recovered from Godier Thiers, you know, notebooks and things like that. Um, this is in the police report that was officially there from the theft of the just judges. And if you take a look, um, what I noticed here, and is everyone else in the research group confirmed this is definitely correct, is there's a, a tree. <clears throat> there in this drawing left behind by Godert Thier. And if you look at the Libra Primus, there's all these images. No one can figure out where they're from or what they are, any of this. Well, it would seem to me that that tree from Godert Thier's notes, let's blow it up here for you, you can see it there, is the same tree from the Libra Primus, right? So it seems to me that that's where they got the idea for the tree from. Um, we know that they're likely, some of the people that made the original cicada stuff are likely over in Europe in this region. So that would make sense. And we found a lot of other clues uh, the do with St. Bavo Cathedral and this Just Judges painting and all of that that would tie in with the Libra Primus and let us know that we are on what would seem to be the right path um, collectively. It's all of us solving this together, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm just doing the streams, the live streams, but the people doing like the heavy lifting, the real hard research, as I'm about to show you, um, <clears throat> are making some like excellent finds. So anyways, take a look here. Uh, at this flicker photo, you can see the tree again there. So there it is again. And I believe so. Same tree from Godier Tier's stuff. It's the same tree as the Libra Primus one. So we've identified what the tree means and where it came from. <clears throat> so this is a breakdown I've put in here of the Ghent altarpiece. And I'm actually going to revert back to that and skip forward for a second. Onto, uh, but this breakdown of the Ghent altarpiece is really, really excellent. I would highly recommend anyone interested in this go watch that the guy did a great job breaking it down but anyways uh not me but one of our top-notch crew of pirate solvers made a new discovery 
So what we've uncovered in basically two weeks took other solvers years to solve. And we succeeded where they failed. We have done it. They never bothered to look at Liber Primus phonetically, as we talked about recently with the three different phonetic languages. They never bothered to find the primes in the music. As I was telling you before, the music, uh, the instar emergence, has a frequency to it. The first two cicada puzzles were easy. Any computer geek could have figured out the substitution ciphers, the outgus, the open puff. The solvers hijacking the Reddit and IRCs were not interested in solving the puzzles. They wanted to own the puzzles. Marcus Wanner is a prime example. Same with Lestat and Defango and Esteban. We know some of the Cicada 3301 creators are European, or at least know some of them. Uh, some of the original images from the puzzle came from Belgium, um, as I just showed you above. Like obviously, um, I've identified that as being from Godier Thiers' notes, which is Belgium. <clears throat> we know some of the puzzle jackers were admins or moderators on Reddit. We know they have big egos, which is in complete opposite of the Cicada tenants, privacy and absence of ego. And the other thing with me in Reddit, uh, maybe I won't talk about it in this live stream, but we've talked a lot about Reddit and how compromised Reddit is as a platform. Um, I don't want to divulge too much into this topic so it doesn't get taken off of YouTube. But for instance, someone that we talk about all the time with the initials GM, who's in prison facing trial right now, was a top moderator on Reddit, for example. So anyways, what our pirate solver was able to determine using the three languages that we identified um, in earlier streams is these are the translations so far of these Liber Primus letters. So a lot of the Liber Primus remains completely undecipherable and I believe that this guy uh, one of our anonymous pirate solvers that's helping us with this I think he cracked a bunch of these so you can see Sowulo, uh, Sun, and this is in the uh, Elder Futark in the runes. Iwaz, Horse, Gebu, Gift, Manaz, Man, uh, Laguz, Water. And you'll see Water um, a ton of times in these paintings. It's like one of the main themes of the paintings that, uh, that we've been looking at. Wealth. Uh, Peruzas giant and there's a there's a giant in the painting as well on Zeus God obviously the entire painting we've been looking at is about God and the salvation of man and how the new covenant was baptism not circumcision <clears throat> Opila inherited land uh, you can see in the painting that we're looking at all the time, there's the New Jerusalem, the, the unknown towers that we can't decipher. They're all, it's supposed to be New Jerusalem. Wuncho Joy, Burkana Birch Twig, Iwas Yew Tree, Isa Ice, Aroots, Arox, Perb, Luck, Algiz, Sedge, Dagas, Day, Telwaz, the God Tear. And you can see some of these we don't have uh, like a uh, translation for some of them. Like you can see none on a couple of those. Maybe those are not in that language. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Who knows? Uh, you can see that one, Sun, uh, E, Horse, Gift, Mam, once again you have Water, another Giant, God, Inherited, so you can see all this again, Class, Younger, Futark, Runes, alright, so you can see this is what's been determined so far. So Elder English, 
Elder Futark. Uh, <clears throat> where did I get this? This came to me from one of the people that we've been working with in this research group in order to try to solve this. And they took some of the stuff we've been talking about and applied it. And this is what they came up with and emailed me. So one of our anonymous pirate solvers uh, figured this out you know this is why I've been doing the research and I put the streams out and there's been you know I don't have a lot of subscribers on this YouTube channel but the video has been getting lots of views because people have been watching them and trying to use the clues in the videos to solve this type of stuff because we're all on this journey together and it's actually it's almost more about the journey than about solving the puzzle because we're learning so much um, about all this as we go along here. I mean, really, like, it's been amazing, so. <clears throat> Anyways, a couple of things about the painting that this guy was talking about. Uh, so, I mean, you can see here these are the new Liber Primus solving. So these are huge. Like we've been able to determine these from analyzing the painting, analyzing music, and it's a three-dimensional puzzle. So you can't just study the code. Um, any computer like genius could figure out like a coded thing if it was just that easy. Uh, obviously there's something more to this puzzle. Like, this isn't just about code breaking, it's about history, it's about spirituality, it's about music and frequency and the reality that we inherit. There's so much here, it's, uh, it's really kind of incredible. So let's take a look at this uh, video here. There's a couple things in here that I kind of wanted to um, point out to you guys that uh, I put in my notes here. So let me just pull them up. So at 19 minutes and 30 seconds into this, he talks about the panels of this painting. And he talks about possibly another... Hi. Bored by it. He talks about a potential another missing uh, panel so we're we're looking for the just judges panel but is there another panel that went missing even before that and are these panels arranged in the proper manner were they even supposed to be together in this fashion hmm a man called Jan van Skoll he was a painter and he's probably the one responsible for the many over paintings that I mentioned before and I shall mention again because for a painter it would often be easier to paint over a large section of say a cloak in, instead of trying to fix very small bits but Jan van Skoll apparently told people that he was very much impressed by the altarpiece but it ha was in very bad shape and that one of the panels was in such bad shape that it was lost and according to him that panel showed the last judgment and that's weird because there is no last judgment here well of course and that's that's very very strange because you have everything else depicted here even the beginning of mankind you have eve holding the forbidden fruit and it's not an apple that she's holding you'll notice uh, she's not holding an apple. She's holding a, a piece of fruit, but it's not an apple. And that's because the Bible doesn't actually say it's an apple. It's just a, a fruit from a fruit tree, the forbidden tree, right? <clears throat> and you have everything else. You have the start of all the problems, and then you have the salvation of mankind with the lamb in the center, with the found, you know, the everlasting life with the the fountain and the baptism and the the baptismal the octagonal baptismal fountain 
According to him, it was lost, so we couldn't have it. But where would it have been? It, it's very difficult to imagine. Yeah, yonder, Paul. That's exactly where everyone made a mistake. It's three phonetic languages. Instead of at, bash, sub, cipher, and all these other things that people tried for a long time. Where you would have an added panel. Now, one of the theories would be that the center three figures are actually replacements for that lost, lost judgment. But that's just a theory. We have no evidence for it. There is another possibility that a last judgment or last judgment scenes could have been used for the predella. A predella sort of functions as a, as a foot of an altarpiece. You place it on top of a predella. And that usually has small images as well. Perhaps there were images of a last judgment there. Um, and it helps that we don't have a predella. So that fits in with that story. It could also be that Jan van Skorl simply made a mistake. Well, we simply don't know where it would have been. And on the other hand, there's a very good argument saying that they do fit together. And these panels were always meant to be together. Because in the, this current restoration, they have examined the wood it all has been painted on. And it turns out that several of the planks used in the lower section come from the same trees as planks in the upper section. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that all of this wood comes from one batch so okay so we basically know that all the panels do belong together but the real question is is there a missing panel it was delivered at the same time so probably all of these panels were made around the same time as well and how many big altarpieces would hubert van eyck have been making at the same time and especially considering that we don't have any others so perhaps they were always intended to be together in this way. And maybe the difference in style comes from... And how, how would this rich couple that wanted to make this painting, this altarpiece, that's hugely expensive, how would they know to hire Hubert Von Eck and Jan Von Eck to paint this thing? That's still a mystery to me. Is why would they hire those two who had no experience prior to paint this that makes no sense and like how like how would they know that hubert van eck and jan van eck would be such good painters like they just like randomly pick these two guys <laughs> seemingly of course when you look into van eck like they're you know it's pretty interesting background two different brothers working on the same project now let's focus on these three figures in the center Usually, on an altarpiece, you'll see as the center image, there would be either the Virgin and Child or a crucifixion. That is in Western Europe. Here, we see three figures, and it's from left to right, the Virgin Mary, then either God or Christ, and then St. John the Baptist. And as I said, you don't really see that on altarpieces in the West. You do see it in the East, though. It's a clear influence of the Orthodox Church. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, this is called the deuses. And deuses comes from the Greek word for prayer. And here you have one from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It's about 200 years older than the Ghent altarpiece. And that's interesting because there's a lot of Eastern like mysticism stuff in the cicada stuff, right? So they, they take like um, knowledge from all areas of the world for the cicada puzzles. So you have like the Eastern and the Western influences in the same painting. So it's like a painting that's like similar to like the methodology or like sort of like the... Uh, the hidden meaning of Cicada 3301, if you will. As I showed you, uh, that image there ties in. And uh, just once again, like we've been able so far to determine these new parts of the Liber Primus. Um, so these are the new decodings. And you guys can see this on uh, hive.blog which on YouTube is in the description box on DLive um, I'll drop in the chat and on Rockfin I'll drop in the chat again and of course it's on 
hive.blog slash at Titus Frost. So if you want want to, uh, oh, forgot to hit go live on Rockfin. We're live now. <laughs> and there's the uh, the chat on, uh, and the chat on Rockfin is now that. So if you missed out on Rockfin, which you probably did, um, just to recap, just because obviously <clears throat> those people who watch over there are supporting the stream. So over there on, uh, we've covered a bit so far. Um, we've determined that this Liber Primus tree came from the Godier Tier notes left behind and from they're found in the official police file on the theft of the Just Judges panel. And these uh, deciphered codes and us taking a look at the code in a phonetic new way led one of our pirate solvers to be able to determine the new characters here on the Liber Primus and what they mean. So when you apply this to the Liber Primus, we're going to start being able to decipher a whole lot more of what the, the Liber Primus says. Because right now only 20% of it is even deciphered, and this will give us a huge chunk more. So from there, hopefully we can continue working on this and continue solving. Um, and obviously huge props to our, our pirate solver that was able to determine this stuff. Anyways, why Van Eyck paintings? Why are they using Van Eyck paintings? Why is there a connection here to Cicada 3301? Because Van Eyck coded all of his paintings. Much like Da Vinci did, Van Eyck was a master of encoding his paintings with hidden meanings and clues and secrets and things of that nature. Uh, for instance, Da Vinci would paint using uh, magnification, you know, and to do that, he would paint like in the eyes of some of his portraits and things, like numbers and things that you could only see with a magnification. You couldn't see with the naked eye. And Van Nick also painted all types of stuff into things that people wouldn't be able to pick up for years and years and years. So as he says here, coded all his paintings. The wife was dead by the time the painting was finished. Catherine Arnolfini was from Florence, as was her husband. She died in early 1434. This is a haunting memorial portrait. So you see here. The lamp, right? Oh, I gotta zoom out. Here you go. So you guys can actually see it. Even bigger, the wife of Arnolfini died in childbirth and she was carrying twins. Notice the candles. Three, uh, three candles out, one survives. Van Eck was an Aspie uh, genius, coded everything he did. He worked in Bruges, the textile capital and premier trading port of Northern Europe. <clears throat> so here is the uh the portrait Jan Van Eck was here. He indicated his image was in the mirror captured. So you can see this here. It's the writing on the wall. And if you take a look at the, uh, the painting, you see this mirror on the wall. You see how there's um, the two figures here that are also in the mirror. And then there's like a person in blue. But there's also a person with... Uh, like a red scarf on his head which would match when you zoom way in I'd have to zoom way in on this for you guys to see it see if I can get a little bit closer that might be indicative of him painting himself in it and he wrote you know Jan Van Eyck was here
it down. David Hockey is convinced that Van Eck and other masters used a camera obscura to create the ultra realism in the in the chandelier, for example. Hockney made a documentary about it, just an interesting fact. Camera obscura would be a magnification. Thomas with the combined Thomas, this combined with Titus research is mind blowing. You have just uncovered a historical art secret. That's that's true. So you can see here is the Ardine Gautier drawing that had the tree in it. Um, I also found this interesting. Uh, you heard the art historian guy talking about overpainting. And one of the things that was overpainted the most was the sky of uh, the Ghent altarpiece. And you can see here in the, the panel the hermits which I'm going to talk a lot about tonight. You can see in that panel, I don't know if this has any meaning to it or not, but to me, I don't know if you guys can see it, and as always, images in the clouds, you know, people lay on their back and look up at the clouds and everyone sees something else and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But to me, it looks like someone riding on a four-legged type animal and, you know, maybe a wave coming in maybe indicating like the lost spirits of the flood of men where the whole world was flooded and like their spirits are still here you know what I'm saying I don't know just sort of my take on it uh, when I look at it that's kind of what I see but it could be nothing um, and interestingly they did say that a lot of the sky was overpainted and that there was a lot of detail in the sky that was being revealed when they restored it and this is one of the panels that's been restored so this probably this detail in the sky was probably um, you know overpainted until recently so I mean I don't know it looks to me like almost like a like a guy on like more of like a leopard type thing than a horse and a giant wave coming up from behind and considering the nature of what the rest of the painting is about, that could easily be a reference to the flood, because the rest of the painting is all about biblical stuff, so that would make sense. Uh, we just took a look at the Arnolfini wedding portrait, and you can see Jan Van Eyck signed. Van Eyck was here, you know. I mean, you see here we're talking about the the camera obscura thing because when I was watching like do, I've been watching a lot of documentaries on artworks and other artworks by Jan Van Eyck and Leonardo da Vinci trying to like increase my knowledge base on this stuff so I can further help decipher these things for you guys and uh, when I was watching that stuff, I found it interesting about, you know, Da Vinci using magnification in order to paint, like, little numbers and other little secrets into the eyes of a lot of his subjects because he thought the eyes were the window to the soul. So he used the eyes to, like, hide things within. And, um, you know, as you can see, the eyes the look within. You'd hide in things in the eyes. And I wonder if Van Eck did that as well. And with that being said, we know he did because there's there's clear like evidence of that in his, his paintings and such. So you have to wonder like what is on the Just Judges panel that might be only seen by you know microscope or by through some sort of magnification. <clears throat> and you're saying some say the camera obscura we can prove that with da vinci maybe camera lucinda with van eck he would have access to all sorts of the newest european and arabian inventions and technologies in bruges and it would seem to me that that is probably likely because um it seems to me there's like some sort of tie between da vinci and van eck the do with all of this and 
maybe they were both like members of the Priory of Sion or something like that. Uh, and Da Vinci was big time into using like new and inventing even technology like way ahead of his time. Um, so interesting. Oh, also up here in this uh, breakdown of the stuff, there was another section I wanted to to cover. I think it was about what was it, thirty six, I believe, minutes in. Yeah. And it talks about speaking of the overpainting and stuff. So let's let's hear this little section here on it. in the in the sky most of that sky has been overpainted probably in the 16th century and so it had to be removed and right now it, it looks prettier than it did before but there's one little detail that I couldn't find described in any of the reports as they have been published so far and that's one about this very conspicuous centrally placed tower this is a church spire right in the middle and it is the only absolutely recognizable tower in the entire painting. It's a tower that is in the northern Netherlands. It's in a city called Utrecht, which, by the way, happens to be the place where I live. And this is the actual tower. It is of a very particular design, that it has two square sections on top of each other and then an octagonal that is really open, called a lantern. Now, this is the real thing, but it's kind of strange to... Remember, we also identified that in the painting like a week or two ago. We were like, oh yeah, that's that tower in Utrecht. Now, the interesting thing is, was that tower even supposed to be in the painting? You find this very recognizable church tower right there in the center of this painting because this was a cathedral. It has its own bishop and... It's a different bishop than the bishop of Ghent. It's a different diocese. So why would they have that church tower there? Well, one story I was always told is that the first, uh, that during the first restoration, Jan van Skool added it. Because Jan van Skool, you know, man I mentioned before, he was from Utrecht. And maybe as some sort of tribute to his city or, well, to himself, um, he just added this. Well, that's the story I was always told. But during the restoration, of course, they could find out because they could see what layer of paint this is. But so far, they haven't published that result. Maybe because it's so central to the picture that they don't want to remove it. Although, at the very center of the picture, they did remove something. And that's when, if we return to the lamb for a second, this is the lamb as... I'd always known it. It's a, well, a lamb. And there's always been this one very peculiar thing about it. And that is that it had four ears. You can see this, well, lamb and his ears, and just below them, you can see there's two more sort of bits sticking out. And they're actually, well, ears. Which always told people that this is probably an overpainting and there's a different face underneath. Now in this restoration they've removed this because this is an overpainting probably from the 16th century. They removed it and revealed what was underneath. And it's been sort of controversial because this is a very different sort of sheep. It's not that sheep-like. The one we had before was much more like an actual sheep. Isn't that also interesting? So they not only changed like all that, he also changed the face of of God. Like he changed the lamb of God's face. So who knows? Like maybe that tower was not even supposed to be in the painting. And you have to really wonder like how much else was changed with this overpainting. And as they continue to restore this thing, Will more mysteries be revealed? Will we find more things? You know, will more things emerge from the layers of the paint? Similar to the puzzle, right? As like more layers are pulled away, you reveal more and more of what was really supposed to be there the whole time. 
And no, yeah, it doesn't look like a sheep's face at all. <clears throat> Continuing on. The lady in the painting. So who is the, the lady in the painting? She was originally known as Costanza, and this is the one with the um, the little dog, and it's the uh, the portrait that we were showing you a second ago with the the mirror on the wall. Costanza Arnolfini, born Trenta, died night uh, died in fourteen thirty three. Ooh, there's that thirty three number. Was born to Trenta and Bartolomea Malaspina. Costanza married Giovanni di Nicolo Arnolfini in 1426. Giovanna was born in circa 1400 in Lucca. His occupation was Kutman ut Lucca, you know, who knows what that means. But he has a uh, very easily searchable family tree. And it's in the show notes if you're interested. So another one of the interesting things about these paintings is um, <clears throat> sort of the the light and how do I like describe this again? <laughs> Basically, uh, like water is uh, like think of water as like a conduit to the spiritual, right? And water itself is an extremely interesting element because when you look at water, it's what you'd call perfectly incommensurable geometry. Um, and like the molecules and all that, when you look really at how they're formed and all this, they kind of like tie back to Pythagorean triangles. And Pythagorean triangles, obviously the three-sided triangle, these are, you know, the Pythagorean primes and prime numbers and cicada and all that. Like comes, you're looking like when you're talking water, like it kind of all ties back to that. And this guy was a master of putting this stuff, this type of like encoded messaging in these paintings. So the light coming through the window, is he hinting at the projection of transparent objects via light? So basically, to these guys at this time, they had a different concept of the world and reality and matter and all these different things. And for them, like uh, a transparent object couldn't be seen until light passed through it which has to do with that orb in the Da Vinci's hand with the three little dots on it and has to do with what you're seeing with the light projections in this empty space where there is nothing. There's, a, there's supposed to be something coming, but it's not there yet. And they're showing you that with the light because the light is going through, but it's not lighting up the transparent object. It's just showing the emptiness, the vast emptiness of the space. But it's also the entire Ghent altarpiece, like above that, are all of the sibyls and the other things that are predicting. It's like John the Baptist, Zachariah, and the two sibyls, the two pagan uh, oracles that predicted the coming of Christ. And then in the, the two panels right below them, you have the empty space showing, you know, that Christ is coming, right? That that's it's the anticipation thereof. Of course, and water is how we're born when it first breaks. And also, water signifies what this whole thing is about. This entire painting is about the New Testament uh, with mankind and salvation, right? Because... If you look at, like, the final panel, right, the middle one, the most important one, you have the fountain of everlasting life. And with that is the baptism, 
It's in the baptismal fountain. You see the eight-sided fountain that's representative of baptism. And basically with the New Testament, which is all throughout this, like Mary is holding uh, the New Testament in her hand. Like you see, like you see, uh, see how the light is coming through the window and they even have like the light illuminating the thing on the windowsill back there. So like if there was like a transparent object, the light would illuminate it, but there, there isn't one. So it's passing through without illuminating it, but they're showing you how it would illuminate a transparent object, right? And then here you have Mary and she's got uh, the New Testament open there to her right. And then up on the shelf behind her is the Old Testament. And the New Testament is basically like the salvation now comes through baptism instead of circumcision and other things from the Old Testament. That's no longer that's no longer how it works. Now salvation comes through uh, baptism and water. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what they're symbolizing here, right? And that's all come forth because of the sacrifice of God. Uh, sun, which you see in the right above the fountain, right, and all the angels here are holding the arma de Christi, the the spear of destiny, the nails and the cross and the the pillar he was tied to, and all that. That's what those angels are all holding around the Lamb of God. Okay. <clears throat> So interestingly, um, a lot of these questions have been answered, of course, uh, but um, I was taking a look at these panels more up close from the Ghent altarpiece, and there was some interesting stuff that I found. So one, one of the things to me I found very interesting is this panel called the Hermits. Now, Hermits are monks, right? They're the monks. And to me, you know, you have the Knights Templar looking cross on one of the monks and the Knights Templar, which would eventually become, you know, like the precursor of the Illuminati and the Freemasons and all that. One of their big things was to live in poverty. So when you became a Knights Templar, you would give up all your worldly possessions to the Templar order and live as a monk would. So the monks, right? The Knights Templar and the monks. And that's, I feel like that's what they're representing is the, the very first monks that would eventually lead to the creation of things like the Knights Templar. And why do I say that? Because when I first looked at this panel, I thought based on how, you know, the other fe a lot of the other females painted this way are angels. Yet that's not what these two female characters here in the back are. The one on the left is Mary Magdalene. Okay, and Mary Magdalene's massively important, especially to a lot of people think, like for instance, that Mary Magdalene was the mother of the birth line of Christ. So Christ got Mary Magdalene pregnant and Mary Magdalene had a child and the Holy Grail is the bloodline of Christ. And it, as we talked about some people, the Illuminati particularly, I, I believe that they believe the Merovingian line comes from that. And that's why the Merovingian line is always propped up and that's why they've been so many kings and queens over the years and the Templar order has always existed to sort of prop up the Merovingian bloodline and the other bloodlines of the Illuminati ever since they, they learned this big secret of the Holy Grail and Mary Magdalene and all of this. And um, I'm sure there's some relevance to what she's holding in her hand there. Uh, and I just found that all kind of interesting that here in this this panel here you have the knight, what looks to me like the precursor of the Knights Templar, and then Mary Magdalene. Mr. Wordsmith says, baptismal regeneration is an ancient heresy. 
salvation comes through Christ, not baptism. Baptism is the public profession of faith, an effect of salvation, not the cause. Okay, yeah, correct. Thank you for correcting me on that. <clears throat> See, I'm not a I'm not a biblical scholar, so I'm I'm allowed to make those mistakes. <laughs> If I was a biblical expert, I would, I would be like, oh, how dare you <laughs> challenge me on the Bible. But no, you're correct, Mr. Wordsmith. My bad. So anyways, when I, I've been trying to figure out, like, what are these these towns with all these these chapels and stuff? And the the art historian guy that I gave you guys at the beginning his video, he breaks this down as the only identifiable tower is the one from Utrecht, and then the rest of these cities and towers are supposed to be representative of the New Jerusalem. Like the New Jerusalem that is coming, that has been built, um, and all of that type of stuff. And then here was another really interesting one to me, because like I've talked about the Nephilim and all this in the past. And here you have this giant guy, um, and supposedly, oh, I can't remember the name. Uh, someone nailed it, though, in the replies. But he carried people across the river. Um, thought someone nailed it in those replies, but yeah, he... He's from the Bible. He's a character in the Bible that carried people across the river. And uh, at the end, when he carried like the last person across the river, he, he get heavier and heavier as he crossed. And then as he, he got all the way across, the angel, or I, it might have been Christ, turned around and said to him, you've carried the weight of the world on your shoulders. Right? And that was like the last person he had to carry across. The river. And also, interestingly, this is from the copy of the Just Judges, but I think they they tried to paint what was originally there in the first place. And I wonder if these towers are identifiable or not. Uh, people can try to figure out if these do exist somewhere. That'd be interesting. And this is uh, like a zoom in of the buildings in the missing panel. But this, of course, is the, the remade copy of it. So this is not the original painting. But hopefully these are close to what was in the original painting. But we don't know for sure. All we have is a really blurry image of the original. <clears throat> Which doesn't have color in it either, by the way. So the colors could be completely different than what the, you know, the, the new copy is. So water and baptism, and who is defined by water? John the Baptist. which is what the, the, the St. Bavo Cathedral is all about. So the St. Bavo Cathedral is all about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is all about water, and the St. Bavo Cathedral is also known for the Ghent altarpiece. And this was an interesting comment on it, I thought. Reading right to left, I see light, water, magnetism. Arch form is the dipolar horseshoe magnet. Human in R panel with the angel in crown space. Angel in the left panel doing the come hither finger. The ascension path is through light, water, and magnetism. Interesting. 
It's an interesting take on it for sure. Another thing about the, the tall guy, Giants, quote, and there was, again, war at Gath, and where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was descended from the Giants, 2 Samuel 2120. The Nephilim, some people would call them. The Hermits in the Portrait of Isabella. So the red robe may signify that the church, originally called the Church of St. John, would naturally want the Baptists to be front and center. The Hermits signify those who have removed themselves from the temptations of the common man. Look at this. Portrait of Isabella of Portugal was a betrothal painting. The early Flemish artist Jan van Eyck, in one of his earliest works, now lost, known only from copies, it dates to 1428 to 29, visit to Portugal on behalf of Philip the Good when he was sent as part of an embassy to evaluate the then 30 year old Isabella's suitability as a bride for Philip. Van Eyck was tasked by Philip the Good with bringing back two most likely a pair were painted to increase the probability that one would make it to the Netherlands. Faithful representations of her likeness for the Duke to evaluate. Because Portugal was ridden with plague, their court was itinerant, and the Dutch party met them out of the way of the castle of Aviz. Van Eyck spent nine months there, returning successively to the Netherlands with Isabella as a bride-to-be. The couple married on Christmas Day of 1429. The portrait was executed around the time the preliminary marriage was drawn up to be sent concurrently to Philip with the document of agreement. In this, it was intended as eyewitness testimony to the person of the princess, providing independent verification of her identity when she later traveled to Philip in Burgundy. So they literally used this painting of this, uh, this you know, bride-to-be, if you will, to identify her. <laughs> when she showed up. <laughs> the Bible is real, but it's celestial cycles and astrotheology because the stars were what they were referring to, the star of Bethlehem and numerology. This is what they're not telling you. Interesting comment on DLive. Rubens and a second uh, altarpiece. Did you know Rubens, who also commissioned to create an altarpiece for the same church a century and a half later? So, interestingly, so this guy Rubens, Paul Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, made this one, oil sketch for high altarpiece, Bavo Ghent. See here, by Peter Paul Rubens. So we have another, another altarpiece painting here, also an oil sketch, oil painting. And on the Just Judges panel, um, <clears throat> there was this on there. I believe this is from the photograph of the panel. Speaking of mirrors, has anyone noticed this? I think it's Dutch. So on the Just Judges was this reverse uh, writing in Dutch. And when you flip it around uh, the proper way, this is what it, uh, it looks like. Oh, here you go. Flipped right here. Sorry. So if any of you can decipher, you know, you figure out the Dutch and let me know what that says, that would be great. You can add it to the uh, comments on YouTube or hit me up on Twitter. But there you go. It looks like Dutch. I'm not 100% sure. 
And that would have been on the missing panel, the Just Judges panel. Yeah, it's not that, it's not that <laughs> Rubens there, Gizmo Glass. It's a different, different, talking hundreds of years ago, Paul Rubens. Archaeology of St. Bavo. Starting to dig into the archaeology of St. Bavo, prior to its construction, there was a chapel dedicated to St. John. Now looking into the boneyard. Let's see here. Bone wall made of human limbs and skulls discovered under church in Belgium. These bones likely came from an old graveyard that was cleared hundreds of years ago. Archaeologists recently discovered walls built from macabre material, human bones, including shattered skulls, while excavating the grounds of a church in Ghent, Belgium. By the end of the excavation, archaeologists had uncovered nine walls built mostly with adult thighs and shin bones. The intermediate zones were filled with skulls, many of them fragmented, according to Rupert Willart. Restoration, archaeology, decoration. The Dutch company found that the walls during an excavation ahead of construction for a new visitor center at the cathedral. These ghastly structures were likely the work of people who hundreds of years ago cleared out an old graveyard to make room either for new bodies or a church renovation, said archaeologist Yannick de Grace on staff at Ruben Willart and the excavations project leader. When clearing a churchyard, the skeletons cannot just be thrown away, de Grace told Live Science in an email. Given that the faithful believed in the resurrection of the body, the bones were considered the most important part. Safeguarding human remains was so important that sometimes stone houses were built against the walls of city graveyards that housed skulls and the long bones in what they called an ossuary. I don't know about that. I mean, that is, that is something else. The bone walls were discovered in the north side of St. Bavo's Cathedral, formerly known as the Church of St. John the Baptist or St. John radiocarbing dating of the bone suggests they date to the second half of the 15th century, but the walls were likely constructed later in the 17th or 18th century, DeGris said. And this is literally nightmare stuff here, <laughs> someone said in the chat, yeah. Don't have any comparison in Belgium, de Gris said. Most graveyards consist of large pits or layers filled with loose human bones. We have never seen structures like walls, which are intentionally built with human bones. I mean, look at that. That doesn't look like they just did that like by that looks like they were doing that intentionally, like they're like building something. What else is buried around this cathedral? The walls consist of only bones from lower limbs, DeGris said. At the moment, we're still examining which idea caused this. It's only a practical thing, piling up bones in a very compact way, or is there also religious, spiritual dimension? While there are bones built uh, from both adult men and women, children's bones appear to be absent from the walls which conflicts with the known life expectancy from that time period when children often died of disease. But it is typical of bones from cleared tombs, according to a statement from Rupert Willart. Children's bones are small and fragile, so they were not collected. For now, the bones are getting a new home at the University of Ghent, where they will be examined as part of a detailed inventory. So there you go. The St. Bavo Cathedral in Ghent that we're looking at has walls made of human bones. Right. So you're, I included this here because it goes into Jan van Eyck, his painting, a lot of his background, and another painting by him. 
uh, that this guy broke down. So if you're interested in that, I wanted to include it in the show notes because I thought it might be important. Um, I, I learned a lot about Vanek from watching this and how he uses codes and all of those types of things in his paintings. So it's it was a definite, you know, if you're interested in more information, like where do I go next, I would watch those two art breakdowns of Vanek's paintings, the Ghent altarpiece and... Uh, this one here, the Virgin and Child painting. Uh, very, very like interesting stuff. He even talks about <laughs> why is Jesus holding a parrot, of all things, in the painting. Ah, oh, Jesus was a pirate, mates. He had himself a parrot. <laughs> you don't, you don't find that a little interesting. I find that very interesting. <laughs> So anyways, why does Jesus have a parrot? Jesus was a pirate, mateys. <laughs> so go and take a look at that uh, video there if you're interested in why Van Eyck would paint Jesus with a pirate, uh, I mean a parrot. <laughs> so interesting stuff. And, you know, let's just keep in mind when we're reviewing all of this stuff that we're trying to learn the truth about history because we've been lied to so many times. And if the news is fake, <laughs> our history textbooks are even faker, okay? So just keep an open mind with all these things and let's go where you know, the truth takes us, no matter where it leads, as always. Anyways, I thought this was kind of a interesting, you know, breakdown someone was asking on Twitter or on one of these things what is I think it was on Twitter they're like what is cicada 33 one and even like what is it all about who, who what is it all about so I thought you know this is a good breakdown video that did like you know it's not perfect of course but you don't agree with everything always I have my own thoughts and opinions on it but I thought this broke it down better than like any of the other ones I saw so let's uh, take a look at, you know, at least some of it. Here, let's blow it up on here, give you guys a little bit better. This is the hitting meaning of Cicada 3301 off the channel Toxicologist. The Cicada 3301 tests are undoubtedly the most popular internet mysteries to date, with an unexplainable air of mystery, obscurity, and secrecy which surrounds these legendary pages. We have already made four videos which completely cover all of the known facts about the puzzles themselves. However, Cicada 3301 is much more than just a puzzle, as we are hinted to throughout the different tests with many references to philosophical and mythological books, treatises, and concepts. And this is of course without mentioning the Liber Primus, the sacred book of 3301, which to this day has not been deciphered in its entirety, at least not publicly, and we have no reason to suspect it has been deciphered by private groups either. The Liber Primus pages were initially published in two different batches, one was available publicly in an early phase of the 2014 puzzle, and these are the pages which have been deciphered. In the final step of the test, participants were asked to create a tour hidden service which accepted image uploads, and then to send the link of these hidden services to a specified email address. A few months after the completion of the puzzle, these hidden services received an upload of 58 images, the remaining pages of the Liber Primus. Out of these 58 pages only the final two have been deciphered, while the contents of the remaining 56 are still com- That was until tonight. We just, uh, we just solved, uh, you know, a bunch more of the, the codes. So, that was until tonight. We just solved a bunch more of it. 
completely unknown. These undeciphered pages contain a variety of runes, symbols, and drawing, all of which carry a common mystic and occult appearance. The Liber Primus contains the core of what we believe to be Cicada 3301's philosophical and esoteric beliefs. It is interesting to note how the puzzles evolved in both technological complexity and actual philosophical content. The 2012 puzzle, for instance, contained nothing but a few cryptographic questions and some mentions of the importance of encryption, however it makes no mention of anything mystical or esoteric, other than some of its steps involving book codes from medieval stories of King Arthur, which we do not believe to have any relevance. On the 2013 puzzle, however, things were quite different from the beginning, and there is a very clear evolution in the puzzle's non-essential content. Its initial book code led to the famous Book of the Law or Liber Alvel Legis by Aleister Crowley, which later went on to become the basis of the occult philosophy slash religion of Thelema. Crowley claimed that the book ushered the arrival of a new stage for the spiritual evolution of humanity, known as the Aeon of Horus, and the book proclaims for its readers to do what thou wilt, or to find their own spiritual path and determine their own true will. The book code led to an ISO file for a custom Linux operating system, the important parts of which being its highlighting of the numbers 1033 and 3301. These numbers are special for being mirrored primes, although they are not the first or unique in these circumstances. Also of note is the music file which was included in the ISO, a guitar song called the Instar Emergence. It's original. And that song is what I played at the very beginning of this. And also, you know, yeah, so it sent people to the Aleister Crowley book. But <clears throat> what do we talk about as Christians all the time in the truth community? The Aleister Crowley people and what they believe and letting people know about all that. So exposing that as part of a puzzle is teaching people about the truth of our reality just as we would do as Christians. So, you know, don't be like, oh, they reference an Aleister Crowley thing, therefore they're satanic. That doesn't mean that in any way, shape, or form. Original file name is 761.mp3 and it is 167 seconds long. Both 761 and 167 are primes. Even more interesting is the text generating by running a hex dump on this mp3 file. The Instar Emergence Parable 1,595,277,641 Like the Instar, tunneling to the surface. We must shed our own circumferences. Find the divinity within and emerge. This is the first reference to any sort of esotericism, shedding our circumferences and emerging from the divinity within, like the newborn Instar of cicadas reaching from underground. We can begin to understand the reason for the choice of the cicada as a representation of the 3301 group. The last phase of the 2013 test is also relevant. It is only included in leaks as at this time the testing was already being done on selected individuals, however it has been confirmed by various independent solvers so we assume its legitimacy. This phase led users to a tour web page with a survey of a few different philosophical questions, such as, there is no truth. What you are is more important than what you do. You cannot step into the same river twice. Two people are standing by a lake. One says, that's a lovely reflection in the water the other says I see no reflection, but it's a fascinating assortment of fish, plants, and rocks within the water. Which one is lying? All things are true. Observation changes the thing being observed. I am the voice inside my head. You undoubtedly just thought I don't have a voice inside my head. That is the voice the question is referring to. And this one for me is an absolute mindfuck. <laughs> this this question here, like, wow, that just to me is like, a, it's one of those ones like, what is that voice inside your head? Where does that, where does that come from? It's speaking to all of you right now. <laughs> the voice inside my head is forming the words that you're hearing. It's just one of those philosophical... I mean, Descartes would say, 
I think therefore I am, but is that really the case, you know? Curiously enough, this sort of phrase makes a recurrence in the liber primus in the form of a koan. There were also some more technical and mathematical questions, and of course after this test and another programming challenge the participants who claimed to have solved the puzzle were never seen again online. The 2014 puzzle is when things really became interesting. The test itself opened in a completely different manner from the previous two, which were much more formal. This time the image stated, Hello. Epiphany is upon you. Your pilgrimage has begun. Enlightenment awaits. From here began the most complex test yet, which included references to works by Ralph Waldo Emerson and William Blake, both known for their unconventional and transcendental philosophies. Of course, this knowledge was superfluous to the solving of the test at this point. Eventually solvers were led to an onion which presented them with the first pages of the liver primus, along with the message ultimate truth is the ultimate illusion, and to believe truth is to destroy possibility. Also included was a second mp3 file, called interconnectedness, another great guitar song. The first discovered pages were decrypted using a modified version of the Gematria Primus, a combination of runes and Gematria which was released in the 2013 puzzle with no apparent usage until now. For more information check out our video on the solving of the puzzle, as here we will only focus on the contents of the Liber Primus. As stated previously the pages were released in two batches. The first batch used either no encryption or a very weak cipher, and was thus decrypted very quickly by solvers. We will now read chapter 1 of the Liber Primus. For those who are already familiar with its contents, you may skip ahead in the video, but we recommend a thorough listening as it is very illuminating. A warning. Believe nothing from this book, except what you know to be true. Test the knowledge. Find your truth. Experience your death. Do not edit or change this book, or the message contained within, either the words or their numbers. For all is sacred. Well, this channel experienced our death. We're on the ghost of Captain Frost channel here, because Susan Wojcicki murdered the original Captain Frost. The YouTube star is officially no more. And now it's the ghost of Captain Frost. Welcome, pilgrim to the great journey toward the end of all things. It is not an easy trip, but for those who find their way here it is a necessary one. Along the way you will find an end to all struggle and suffering, your innocence, your illusions, your certainty, and your reality. Ultimately, you will discover an end to self. It is through this pilgrimage that we shape ourselves and our realities. Journey deep within and you will arrive outside. Like the instar, IT is only through going within that we may emerge. Wisdom. You are a being unto yourself. You are a law unto yourself. Each intelligence is holy. For all that lives is holy. An instruction, command your own self. What follows is the first koan which we have uploaded on a separate video on this channel. The loss of divinity. The circumference practices three behaviors which cause the loss of divinity. Consumption. We consume too much because we believe the following two errors within the deception. One we do not have enough, or there is not enough. Two we have what we have now by luck, and we will not be strong enough later to obtain what we need. Most things are not worth consuming. Preservation. We preserve things because we believe we are weak. If we lose them we will not be strong enough to gain them again. This is the deception. Most things are not worth preserving. Adherence. We follow dogma so that we can belong and be right, or we follow reason so we can belong and be right. There is nothing to be right about, to belong is death. It is the behaviors of consumption, preservation, and adherence that have us lose our primality, and thus our divinity. Some wisdom. Amass great wealth. Never become attached to what you own. Be prepared to destroy all that you own. An instruction. Program your mind. Program reality. 
After this follows another koan about the eye which states we have no voice inside our heads being the voice inside our heads. This is a repeated concept from the 2013 puzzle. Here, the master explains that this eye is the voice of the circumference. Finally, we have an instruction. Question all things discover truth inside yourself follow your truth impose nothing on others. Followed by a string of numbers. These were the initial pages released to the public. As stated previously some five months afterwards the remaining 58 pages were uploaded to select image servers. Differently from the other puzzles the 2014 puzzle did not have any phase after this one. People were not selected or reached out to, as far as we can tell. The only clue we have is the liver primus. This was reinforced afterwards, with Cicada posting an image stating that the liver primus was the way, its words, the map, their meaning, the road, and their numbers, the direction. Out of these... See, I think... I think what this is implying here with this, Liber Primus is the way, its words are the map. The map to what? Is it the map to the location of the just judges? Is solving the Liber Primus the way to solve the location of the map of the just judges? And with that, with the just judges, can you then find the location of the Arma Christi? You know, the, the instruments of Christ that are on that thing, that are right there in the, in the image. I don't know, maybe there's even more to find, who knows. <clears throat> These 58 pages, only the final... But you can see their meaning is the road. And their numbers are the direction. So you have multiple like hints at that this is leading us to something. Like there's a map that something in the Liber Primus is the, the way to decipher the map. All two were unencrypted, the first stating a hash of a deep web page and the other repeating the parable from 2013's puzzle about the instar tunneling to the surface. And maybe there's a great analysis of the Instar song. Maybe the frequency in there is another way to help decipher this. Um, there might be something to that. I don't know. Just a thought. Other 56 pages are yet to be deciphered by anyone, at least publicly. Well, we, we, the group that we're working with, we figured out some of it. So that's awesome. We're making progress. Now that we have given an overview of the contents released by 3301 we can begin to analyze them and synthesize what seems to be a coherent philosophical theme which runs throughout all of the puzzles and released images. Cicada 3301 seems to be a sort of replication of the initiate religions of old, ancient mysteries which could only be entered by illuminated disciples with strong spiritual foundations. There is a stark contrast and evolution from 2012 to 2014 in regard to the theological complexity of the puzzles. From 2013 on the organization seems to have had the goal of spiritual illumination with a basis on individual liberty and freedom in the technological age. This is reflected in the precepts always stated, that information and encryption are sacred, and the strong use of cryptography in the puzzles. In this form, the group seems to share common thoughts with the cyberpunk and cypherpunk organizations of the early technological age, which influenced numerous artworks and revolutionary thinkers. Cicada is not merely a cyberpunk group, however. Hidden behind its RSA encrypted gates are tomes of ancient and age-old mysteries and wisdoms, revealed since time immemorial by numerous enlightened sages. This becomes obvious when one analyzes the liber primus, its philosophical precepts are very similar to those found in Easter thought, specifically Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, from which Cicada borrows the concept of koans. There are also very strong Pythagorean traces to be found in the sacredness of numbers. In our video about Pythagoras we only touched briefly upon this subject, but in fact it is central to understanding the vast majority of occult philosophies. Numbers are not merely representations of ideas created by the intellect, they are transcendental symbols through which one can recognize many mystical concepts. 
we may touch upon this concept in a future episode of Occult History. But for now let us return to 3301. From the liver primus we can recognize the hidden symbolism for the cicada. Just getting back to this for a second. These uh, geometric shapes and things, you can see them all over the place. There's a fantastic book series and video series called Secrets in Plain Sight by Scott Onstott, I believe. And he breaks down how most of our cities and things have been built to these, you know, sacred geometric designs that the Freemasons and other secret societies have encoded in our entire, like, world. Like, there's cities such as San Francisco, for instance, that are geometrically designed to represent these sacred geometries to a T. Uh, Washington, D.C. is another one of these. Uh, London, Paris... And this has been going on for a long time. Mystical concepts. We may touch upon this concept in a future episode of Occult History. But for now let us return to 3301. From the liver primus we can recognize the hidden symbolism for the cicada. Every 13 or 17 years the instar, or newly hatched cicadas, emerge from the soil. And this is year 17. We're now in Brood X. My first uh, video on all of this was Brood X. As we're seeing the emergence of new solvers, we're seeing the emergence of new information um, that's leading us towards the solving of the ultimate Cicada 3301 puzzle in the 17th year. Shedding their old skins or circumferences and fly around singing their sacred song. We must follow this path shedding our circumferences, our belongings, dogmas, ideas, and predetermined notions of truth, and emerge from the seed ground of the earth to become beings of wisdom within the stars. This keenly represents the hermetic mission of discovering the divinity within oneself, the ancient and ever-present wisdom, and realizing it. Understand, O Hermes, and meditate deeply upon the mystery. That which in you sees and hears is not of the earth, but is the word of God incarnate, these words are stated in the divine Pimander of Hermes. Similar wisdom is to be found in the Hindu Upanishads, in ancient hieroglyphic texts, and in numerous other ancient religions around the world, back in an age when theology and science were not divided, but recognized as two indivisible parts of a complete whole and worshipped as one sacred art. Cicada 3301 seems to display a similar analysis of the world, an initiatic religion for the 21st century, an age vastly different from anything that has ever come before. The modern man faces a desperating challenge, how does one reconcile science, materialism, and the theology which has lost contact with its original divinity? Like a line of blind men, each led on by the next, believing that the one in front of them has a correct vision, they will forever stumble and wander astray from the one unifying truth which requires no seeking or wandering, it is present in every single moment and object. Through deep meditation and contemplation of the nature of reality, one may achieve the shedding of the circumference and, like the instar, find the divinity within and emerge. That is it for this video. We hope you have enjoyed this pseudo-philosophical e there you go. So that that was a, you know, I thought it was a pretty decent analysis of everything by toxicologists called The Hidden Meaning of Cicada 3301. Just came out July 2020, so it's not too old. Um, no, it's sort of a good breakdown of it. And, like, interestingly, like, <clears throat> for, like, the Christian out there, like, if you take a look at the recent puzzle, for instance... And you take a look at what it's drawing attention to. It's drawing attention to, like, the very proof of, like, Jesus Christ, in my opinion, being, being God. Like, if we go and take a look at the actual Ghent altarpiece up close, let's pull it up again. I want to show you something. Show notes. Place. Where's 
the up close. It's not in there. I'll just have to look for it. Gant alter piece uh, up close. Okay. So if we take a look at the closed side of it, just for a second, and you take a look at uh, the top of this thing. Okay, so <clears throat> you have four prophets of the coming Christ. So if there was ever a question about was there any like, you know, people that like were able to predict accurately the coming of Christ and then that would prove Christ is, you know, the son of God and was prophesized. You have four, four different prophets of that. And this puzzle's drawing attention to a painting that shows all four. Most Christians don't even know about these two sibyls that were pagan oracles that predicted the coming of Christ, right? Most Christians ever hear about the oracle of Delphi, which was not able to predict that. These two, the Erythian and the Cumaean sibyls, were able to accurately predict in writing, because most of these predictions by these sibyls back then were written down that Christ the son of God was coming and predicted all of this so did John the Baptist and Zechariah and that's further proof that Jesus Christ is you know Jesus Christ right and this is all being drawn attention to in this and like the the empty space here in the photo and you know the the angel Gabriel I mean this entire thing is all a story of Christianity right so that's why as a Christian it's like fascinating to look into and learn more about because you're learning so much about your own faith by looking into this stuff so you know to me just sort of a fascinating little thing to add there at the end I hope you guys found this uh, interesting I'm going to play the uh, Instar Emergence song as like an outro because it's like such a fantastic song. And most of you weren't here for it at the beginning, especially our, our awesome fans over there on Rockfin. So thank you everyone for watching tonight. Um, it's only 1048, so I am going to do the how-to cryptocurrency video uh, tonight, but you're going to have to give me a little bit of time to get it organized. Um, if I don't have it organized in time to go live tonight, say it takes me too long to get it all put together, then I will do it in the morning, um, very early in the morning. But I'm trying to do it tonight. So stay tuned out there. I'll be back live in a little bit. And uh, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you haven't done it already, go over to the new YouTube channel. Uh, the Ghost of Captain Frost, and give it a subscription, and then go back over and watch it on DLive and Rockfin, or on Twitch, or on whatever else you're going to watch it on. Don't watch it on YouTube. Watch it elsewhere, but support the YouTube channel so that we can wake up more normies and spread this information, as that's the main battleground of the internet. I appreciate all of you for watching. Thank you very much, and I'll see you guys shortly. Take care.